good evening, everybody. Good to see you all here tonight. Can we just bring the house lights up a little bit so I can see these smiling faces? Um, well, today, before I start, I just wanted to mention that we kicked off at Golden Sands um, this, this morning with the church plant out there and uh, got off to a rip-roaring start. So uh, it's fantastic to be able to be part of uh, something that's bigger than ourselves here in respect to the church and the, and the wider body of Christ that we're, we're part of. Well, tonight I'm going to be picking up on the subject of forgiveness, and at the end of tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to just pull up Bernie and Monica uh, with myself, and we're just going to open up for some questions. We've got one more night on this subject next week with Dave McChesney, but we want to be able to just simply field any questions that might be pressing as we go through this story of forgiveness. So, um, so let me pray, and, uh, and then we'll open up this topic. Father, we thank you that at the very heart of the message of the Christian faith is this word, forgiveness. And it means for us, Lord, that um, we have to take it seriously because the whole act of creation and redemption centers around this word, forgiveness, and what happened on the cross. And so, Lord, as we explore what we are doing over the last couple of weeks of this topic Uh, Lord, it really does impact us as human beings. I just want to pray, Lord, that you'd help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you think about the human body and how it's designed to process process, uh, things that aren't good for us, process toxicity or or, or things that just need to be expelled from our body. And uh, for us, our, our body is made up of these different organs, and a lot of them are about expelling things that are toxic. If they accumulate in your body, you'll die. Okay, so if you accumulate too much um, CO2 in your lungs, you suffocate. Okay, so your lungs are designed to bring in air and expel uh, CO2. And in doing so, you've got this great transaction going on, keeps you alive. Your, uh, your kidneys and your liver do exactly the same thing, don't they? They, they, uh, they cl- clean your blood and allow you to be able to take in food that might not necessarily be 100% for you, but you can be uh, confident that your body is working well when, you're, when these organs are working well. And yet one of the things that causes us a huge amount of pain is this whole area of forgiveness and unforgiveness. And I suppose I wish in some sense our bodies had a third kidney that would process unforgiveness. Wouldn't it be good? If somebody hurt us, and we just knew that our body would process that pain in such a way that within 24 or 48 hours, it was gone from our body. Would that be good? Yeah, I, I sort of think that would be kind of cool. But you see, we were designed by God to live in a society, to live in a community, live in a world where there wasn't such a thing as sin. And so therefore, originally when we were created, sin was never going to be part of our world, and therefore we weren't created to process that. Other things that we were created for, like maybe drinking or eating something that wasn't perfect for you and our body would cleanse it, that's fine. But sin and unforgiveness and all those things that go with it are just not part of our natural being. And yet that's something that, uh, it's something that is very, very toxic. It's something that can change your life and impact your life in ways that uh, will change the course of your life dramatically if we don't process it in a proper way. I can remember over 20 years ago uh, when we as a church were meeting at the community hall and uh, this guy in the church suggested to me that we get this preacher in who uh, he'd heard before and uh, he talked about forgiveness and I didn't know who he was but he came highly recommended. And so he turned up at the hall and, um, and I spoke to him before the service and I said, look, you know, if you could preach for about 35 minutes that would be great. We've got a children's program happening, you know, everything's built around a time so that we can uh, give the children's workers, you know, not too much grief and the kids enjoy their day. And uh, he goes, yeah, that's great. And so off he went and he spoke about forgiveness for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a quarter, an hour and 25 minutes. And at this stage, being the young pastor, I was sort of like a bit nervous about this sort of thing. I didn't know what to do really, so I got to the point where I was at the back of the hall and I stood up and he could see me. He knew that uh, he'd certainly outstayed his welcome. But some of the things that he was saying were uh, just so out there that I, I just was flabbergasted. 
And he was talking about how forgiveness should be unconditional in as much as we should forgive everybody for everything. And uh, he explained to us some things that just uh, blew my mind, where he, he said, oh, you know, he'd counsel a lady who had been raped by gunpoint, saying, oh, you should forgive the guy, and this sort of thing. And, and I, I was just, I didn't know what to do. My elders at the back of the church with me were sort of like looking at each other going, what do we do with this guy? Anyway, he finally stopped, and I went up to him afterwards, and I said, hey, look, um, I don't want to be mean or rude or anything, you're our guest, but I asked you to speech, speak for 35 minutes, and uh, you spoke for nearly an hour and a half. And he goes, yeah, I know. Forgive me? <laughs> and it was one of those times where I'm like, yeah, after I poke your eye out, I'll forgive you. <laughs> you know? And, and there are times in the life of church community where people take advantage of the fact that we should be loving, caring, and forgiving. And uh, it's quite difficult in church life, isn't it? Because once people get a hold of that, um, I would say at any given time in the life of my church life as a pastor, there's someone who's pushing that one in a negative way, taking advantage of it, leaning in on the grace that we give to people, and taking advantage of the fact that we are slow to anger, and uh, always try, trying to see the best in people and give them another opportunity. And, and that's a real difficult tension for all of us because we shouldn't be taken advantage of in this area of forgiveness. But it's something that uh, you get to the point and you go, hmm, I, I think even Jesus would push back on this one. Yeah? So this morning, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, um, what I'm going to talk about is how forgiveness actually creates in us an opportunity for maturity. And it's not just about this process of forgiveness. There's a bigger picture of what God is doing in you when you are offended and when something goes down in your life and you think, well, this is a big, big deal. What am I going to do with this? But I want to get there by virtue of taking us through a thinking process of what it is that we go through personally when we experience that pain of being offended. So with that... um, I want to ask that question, when we think of forgiveness, our mind will react. Our mind will react by taking us back to that place when we were offended by something and we then reprocess stuff. So you might be sitting on something now that's happening in your life now and you're going, I don't know how to handle this, or this could be something historic. So I've got a list of things here that your mind will tell you that... Um, you should do instead of forgiving. And so here are the arguments. I'll put them up a number at a time. So when you're asked to forgive, you say, but you don't know what he slash she did to me. Okay? They lied about me over and over again. She intended to destroy my career, and she did. You can't imagine the hell I've been through. If you knew what this has done to my family, you would be angry too. They deserve to suffer like they have made me suffer. I'm going to make them pay. I will never forgive those people. Never. Now these are some real common responses when we talk about forgiveness. They're very human responses and they're very, very normal. And I'm not here to say that these responses are sinful. Because this is the starting place for when, it, when you are hurt in this whole area of being offended against or people have spoken or done something against you. These are the starting places of your human nature. Okay, Retribution is sort of part of that whole deal that we feel that we are owed the opportunity to um, push back or to hurt somebody in the same way that we too have been hurt. And the challenge for all of us is that We like to hear the word forgiveness and we like to hear the word sorry until we're the ones who have to say sorry or exercise forgiveness, okay? So C.S. Lewis said it this way, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. How many of you would agree with that? Of course we would. We're only human. We're only human after all. So we start in this common starting place, and I wanted to say to you tonight that this is not a bad place to start. This is a normal place to start. 
Okay? So don't condemn yourself when you've been offended and you feel that immediately you, you owe that person an equal measure of pain. Okay? The trick is not to stay there. Okay? The trick is not to stay there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one of the misconceptions about forgiveness is where we're going to end up after this process. You know, we have this misconception that because we're Christians, we should take the person who has offended us the most and we should be able to hold hands with them and walk into the future or join the choir and sing next to them, you know, and, and lovingly invite them to our, our children's birthdays and exchange Christmas presents with them, okay? That's often an unrealistic goal. It might be a Hollywood story ending, okay, but it's not always the way it ends up. This is the problem with this forgiveness, is that we have misconceptions about where forgiveness is going to lead us. So here's, here's a few of these misconceptions. It does not mean making excuses for other people's bad behavior, okay? You've got to be truthful about bad behavior. Don't make an excuse for it. Particularly parents, don't make excuses about your children. It does not mean overlooking abuse. Okay, we've just been looking at uh, that hashtag me too, hashtag church too. We're not talking here about ignoring sinful behavior and allowing it to continue. It does not um, mean denying that others tried to hurt you repeatedly. You don't have to pretend and tell lies about that person. Uh, it does not mean letting others walk all over you. Christian love isn't about being a doormat. And it does not mean refusing to press charges when a crime has been committed. Okay? I've had situations in, in my 20 years here where the best thing that I've been able to do is take somebody who's offended another person and we've gone and talked to the police about it. You're not trying to say, we make excuses for your criminal activity. We're saying, look, we have to find the best answer, the right answer, and one that's going to be a permanent answer, not living in fear of the, the past catching up with you. It does not mean pretending that you were never hurt. Christian faith and Christian love doesn't mean that you erase your emotions. Okay, I'm a rock. Okay, that's not what you're about. It doesn't mean that you must become best friends again. Okay? And it doesn't mean that there must be a total reconciliation if, as if nothing ever happened. Okay? Because we're told to forgive, but we aren't told to forget. And part of the process might be simply that you've become a lot more conscious of how this person is wired, and it's good for you to keep your distance because of their personality type and your personality type clashing, or you just see things differently. It does not mean that you must tell the person that you have forgiven them, okay? This is between you and God. You don't have to humble yourself to the point where you say, I have forgiven you, unless God calls you to do that, okay? Because that, in that humility, it could be an empowerment of that person's uh, bad process or bad actions or bad thoughts or or whatever else has been going on. And it does not mean that all negative consequences of sin are cancelled. Okay, once you forgive, it doesn't wind the clock back and history gets to rewrite itself. Okay? So there are certain things that forgiveness will do, uh, but um, forgiveness is a process. And the process of forgiveness requires patience. One of the things that... Um, that I've found over the years is that, and I mentioned this before um, some time back now, but I realise that when I've been hurt in a situation, somebody said something either intentionally or unintentionally or something's happened and I've been caught up in that process and I'm feeling a bit wounded, um, I realise that I have to take a, a three to four day process to be able to get myself back into a, at least an equilibrium where it's not my pain that's actually working out what my next step should be. Does that make sense? You know, if somebody really offends me, first thing you want to do, take their head off. Okay? And then you realize that just too much blood, clean it up. And, and the second is, you know, you just want to sort of um, inflict sort of small amounts of pain, okay, without taking their heads off. And then about the third day, fourth day, you start to realize the size of it, 
the, the actual problem starts to right size itself. You've prayed about it, you've talked to uh, somebody who's close to you about it, and then you start to get some perspective. And it's remarkable the difference between what you will feel in that first 24 hours versus what you will feel half a week later. It is remarkable. And therefore, the level of toxicity that you will bring back if you res- respond or react too quickly is, is, is incredibly different to what will happen in that moment. Okay? So you've got to realize you, that uh, when, when you've been offended and when you've been hurt and, and there's a whole need for forgiveness going on here, that God actually sees the bigger picture and he understands the process. The God who we've already spoken about tonight is being intimate, the one who whispers. He could be saying to you, just be patient. Just hang on. Okay, because God is talking not only to you, but he's talking to the person who's offended you and other people who are in the mix. And sometimes we rush in to fix everything ourselves, and it's like throwing a gallon of petrol upon a fire. You know, you're not going to get a good result. You get a blowback, and it'll probably hurt you more. God says in the Scriptures through, through Paul and Romans, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Okay? For it is written... It is, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And this can be a real learning curve for our faith. This can be a time when we've just got to be patient and we've got to dig into God's word, got to dig into prayer and say, okay, God, I'm trusting you. And the best thing that I can do right now is move forward with integrity. You know, I might be accused of doing something. That person's seen something that I've done and they don't like it or that I've been misrepresented. I've been gossiped about in a negative way. And you go, the best thing that I can do is prove that that lie is a lie. Okay? Now, of course, we're talking about here about things when you've been falsely accused. You know, if you've been accused of, uh, of stealing something and you've stolen, well, come on, you've got to deal with it. Okay? You've got to face up and own it. But if you've been accused of something that is negative and wrong and it's a lie, uh, you've got to take that straight and narrow path of trusting God and believing that if you can continue to walk with integrity, God is going to ensure that your reputation makes it intact and out through the other end. But that always seems to take a lot longer than you'd like. Okay? It always takes longer than you'd like. And in that process, you are being refined. You are being refined. And it means that you've got to be patient, means that you've got to have integrity, means that you've got to be in prayer and just working your way through all those feelings and thoughts of injustice that you're feeling at that time that that occurs. Let's uh, unpack this scripture a little bit more because it carries on. It says, um, uh, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, the heaping of burning coals on its head, um, I think traditionally it actually had the wrong um, interpretation placed upon it. It's like, hey, you know, if you're really nice to the person uh, who hates your guts, um, it's sort of like burning their head, you know, because they feel that, you know, your love uh, being projected upon them, um, that's going to make them feel, feel, you know, sort of burnt in a way. But the literal interpretation of it is more true. When you would gather in ancient times and you would be meeting around a fire, literally with somebody, and it was time for that person to go home, what you would do is you'd take some embers from your fire and you'd put them in a pot with a deep uh, clay bottom on it and they would put that on their head and they would carry it home. And then when they got home to their place, they could quickly light a fire and get the, the house warm. And so what it is, it's an act of kindness, okay? Notice how the the scripture there is is mentioning two other kind things. Uh, You know, hungry, feed them, thirsty, give them something to drink. And when they're going to go back to a cold home, make sure it's your fire that has started the warmth in their home for that night. Okay, so you like that? That seems more in keeping with what the tone of the scripture is, eh? Um, So we're not to take revenge and we're to allow room for God. Now, this is a, another verse that I think is really applicable in, in this whole area of forgiveness. It's more indirect than direct. But in Colossians, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, 
Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against, a grievance against somebody, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Verse 13 there, it says, bear with each other and forgive one another. Okay, the bearing with one another is literally put up with one another. Okay? Okay, some people think you should go and have a beer with one another. Maybe, maybe if you had to. That was a joke, but. But beer with one another. Um, as in, recognize that not everybody's the same as you. Okay? You know how we say we can't bear that person? Well, God's saying there's difference in the body of Christ. This is what this letter is addressing, people in the body of Christ. We're all different. And so for some of us, we've got to look at each other and go, you know what? I'm committed to loving you because you're my brother and you're my sister in the Lord. Okay? Now, you don't walk up to somebody and say, man, I hate your guts, but I'm told I'm supposed to love you. Okay? That's, that's not exactly Christian love at, at its best. Okay? But what we're told here is that we should be able to make allowances for difference. Okay? The body of Christ is a remarkable remarkable place because there are so many people with so many differences and yet the commonality we have is Christ okay and that's the thing that we need to celebrate and that's why um, we're told here through Paul that um, we should forgive as the Lord forgave us and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity so we should be looking at how we can love one another even in that that point of difference and then I love this how it continues on it says let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell in you, richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now that sounds like one of these wonderful verses, you know, where the, where the uh, fireworks go off and it's lovely Christian harmony and we all hold hands and sing, we're one in the family of God, you know? You've never had to do that, have you? You don't know what you missed out on. That's what church was like a little bit in my younger days. But right in the middle of this section here, which looks like it's all love and rose petals, is a word admonish. Admonish one another. Let me tell you this. You can tell how mature a Christian believer is when you start talking about this word admonish. Admonish is another name for correction. Correction with love. Admonish one another. Look, one, literally one of the reasons why we've got lots of different churches in our city and, and all around the world is because somebody's tried this word admonish and so somebody does a runner. You know, I don't need you telling me what to do or why you should think I should think. I'm out of here. I'm gone. But admonishing is an act of love. It's an, you know how it is at times when you're going to say, hey, look, um, I think we need to tell this person that their behavior is wrong or their attitude is wrong. And uh, you, know, you look at them and you go, ah, rather you than me, bro. I'm not going to talk to that person about that. You know? And uh, I had this scenario, I had mentioned this before from the pulpit, but many years ago when I was working for the government and I was a, a team leader and uh, all the guys in my team were older than me, some of them t older than my dad. And there was one particular guy, Rex, um, who's, uh, who's long gone now, but uh, Rex was a, was just looked like one of these classic government workers who had a suit that was too big for him, uh, sort of crumpled suit crumpled shirt, a tie with about a month's worth of dinners all run down the front of it, and um, he, um, he smoked cigarettes, so these were the days when you could smoke in the office, seems like a million years ago now, but you could smoke in the office. Anyway, the woman on my section came to me one day and they said, hey listen, uh, Craig, you're Rex's boss, we think we, you need to have a conversation with him. I said, about what? And they said, can you tell him that he stinks? <laughs> oh my God, God. <laughs> yeah, I don't get paid enough for this, you know. And so I, I went home that night and I said to Michaela, I said, oh, I've got to have a big conversation with Rex tomorrow. And, uh, 
And she goes, why? And I said, well, the, the woman in the office said that he stinks. And he sits behind me, and, the, and you know what? They're right. He does. And so anyway, the next day I took him into um, a room. We could chat. And I said, Rex, I've got to have a conversation with you, which is really, really hard. It's embarrassing for me to talk to you about this. But um, your body odour is really bad, and the, you need to do something about it. I, th- I said, I think it's the cigarette smoking. I suspect it's because you've been a, a widower on your own for a long, long time now. And he looked at me, and he just, his head just sunk, you know. And uh, I was like, oh, he's going to cry. I was like, oh, no. Anyway, he, he, he looked up at me, and he goes, he says, you see the scar on my head, Craig? And I could just make it out. He goes, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, I see the scar there. He said, when I was 18, I fell off my motorbike, and I lost my sense of smell. I've never been able to smell anything all my life since 18. And Rex was in his 60s by this stage. And I said, well, look, Rex, I just hope I'm doing you a favor, you know, by telling you this. And I'm telling you this because I'm your friend, you know. And uh, I just want you to know that it's, um, that's, it's just, just a reality. And uh, so we talked about a few things about it. And uh, anyway, two days later, he turned up in the office. He had been down to the perfume shop, the, de- the de- deodorant shop. He had stuff under his arms, on his neck, on his face, on his shirt, on his trousers. And uh, he was just like a walking bouquet. <laughs> and, uh, and the girls come to me and say, we don't know whether Rex smelt better before or <laughs> what he does now. Because uh, we know how much he gets paid and he's only bought cheap perfume and cheap aftershave. So he smells real bad. And I was like, well, you've got what you're given. This is, the, this is the way it is. I'm not having that conversation again with him. But that is a conversation of admonishing someone. Okay? It's having a hard conversation with somebody in the hope that they will hear the truth in love. And here we find it in the middle of this sort of wonderful set of values and virtues that Paul's talking about to the church in Colossae, saying, listen, in the midst of celebrating one another and enjoying the company of being in fellowship, you've actually got to correct one another. And the problem with correcting one another is that we don't like to be corrected. And often it can be simply a matter of us being corrected, and we interpret that as an offense, and next thing you know, we're, we're uh, real ha with people, we're grumpy with them, and uh, we're running around saying, look how much I hurt, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. I've been hurt by somebody. They told me off. I really want to say this, and this is really, really important. What offends you defines you. What offends you defines you. If you get offended by tiny little things, that means your character is a tiny little thing. You know what I'm saying? If you go to McDonald's and somebody buys you McDonald's and they hand you the little packet of chips and they get the big one. (laughs) See what I mean? (laughs) And you're offended by that? How big is your character? Yeah? You've you've had that scenario when you're merging in traffic? Okay? Okay? And you've, you're ahead of the person by half a car length, and they're trying to speed up, and you're like, what are you doing? What are you up to? You know? And then you, and you pull out in front, and all of a sudden, they're nearly, they're nearly in your back seat. You know? And you're like, yeah, like this? You know? Telling them, one way, Jesus! You know? Yeah? Seriously, if that's going to upset you, how big is your character? Is she? Paul, I... Um, were you? Is that right? <laughs> Just keep holding it tight because I understand the punches don't hurt when you're in close eye, Paul. But, but with all seriousness, with all seriousness, what hurts us and what defines us in respect to what we feel um, needs to be an act of forgiveness by, on, uh, on our behalf um, is a really big deal. And so I think one of the key questions is um, when you're hurt by somebody, 
is not immediately jumping to be offended because some people get empowered by that. They love to be empowered by somebody who's hurt them. Oh, you wouldn't believe what they did to me. Oh. Ah. It's true. And then you hear what the story was and you go, really? Oh, wow. But the key question is when you are feeling hurt, you've got to ask, why do I feel this way? Remember I talked about that process of three or four days that I take to unpack some of my own feelings? This is the key question. Why do I feel this way now after that comment? What was it that offended me? You know, was it simply the fact that I was challenged? And who are you to challenge me? You know, did I have to get off my high horse and somebody just hauled me off? Is that God speaking to me? Why do I feel this way? Do I feel this way because what they said was 100% accurate? And I just feel like I've been exposed as a fraud? Asking yourself, why do I feel this way, allows you to right-size the problem and see it as an opportunity to learn and for your character to mature. Okay, not every little offense that you have thrown at you is worthy of the fight, is it? Well, seriously, we're not going to fight over who got the bigger bag of chips at Macca's. Okay? But some have. <laughs> Especially when you get your two brothers there, you know. Okay? But what offends you defines you. And, and this is where we, we have to push on to maturity. And owning your responses makes you mature. Okay? A child just has a tantrum. Okay? A three-year-old child will have a tantrum. They, they don't think about why they're having a tantrum. They just have a funny feeling. It over, overwhelms them. They're sad. They've missed out on something. And they have a tantrum. I know 70-year-olds and 80-year-olds who still have tantrums. Seriously. I'm not, I'm not fooling. You know, just because somebody's 70 or 80... They actually might be 14 years with about 65 years' experience <laughs> at being 14 years old. Just because you've got some age, it doesn't mean that you've matured. You only mature as you take on the bigger problems of the world, and some of those bigger problems are the way that you handle the way that people treat you. So, to finish up, I, I leave us with the ultimate picture of why we need to be taking our offenses and learning from them is because when we see Christ in the way that he was treated and his response to those who mistreated him was, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Sometimes as a mature Christian or who's growing towards maturity, your first response has got to be, Lord, I forgive that person because they don't know what they do. They don't know the full story. They don't know the full picture. And for the sake of what's going on here, I just need to suck this one up. I just need to take this one on the chin. And I need to allow you, God, to take care of the learning process that is happening now in this other person's life. And the best thing I can do is give them some space, not react, and allow them to learn as I mature in this process. So there's a hundred ways in which we can handle forgiveness. Uh, but it always comes back to the fact that forgiveness is our goal because Christ forgave us. And that's our starting place. Okay? Well, I'm going to invite Monica and Bernie to come on up now. And uh, can we just... Yeah, just, oh, I just wanted to check that that aircon was still on. It's getting hot in here. Maybe it's that talk about how your character defines your... Your offences define your character. But um, we just wanted to make sure that if you had any questions that um, you feel could be helpful for others or yourself, that you've taken the time to, uh, to ask us these. We'll take a seat and we'll pretend what we know, know what we're doing. And um, Monica will answer all your questions. Yes, she will. So...
Sorry, that really um, struck home with me when you said what uh, offends us defines us. Yeah. And it leads me to the question, what about righteous offence? Righteous anger? Righteous offence, not anger. That's an, that's an emotion. Offence is something you take in anger, something you emit out. Yeah. For me, oh, for yeah. me personally, you know, if I get angry, I erupt. I, I don't hold it in. Okay. But offence, I will hold in. Okay. So, yeah, sorry. But, yeah, what about righteous offence? Well, scriptures tell us that we can anger but don't sin. You know, we can be angry, but we, we shouldn't be sinful in that process. So, in other words, um, this isn't meeting fire with fire. You know, it's, it's a kind word turns away wrath, as Proverbs tells us. And so we need to be in control of our response. That's, one of the, that's the first thing that we've got to be able to do, is say, I'm going to be happy with what I say now, tomorrow, and in a week's time. And that, for me, gives me a huge amount of um, reason to just slow down and make sure that I'm saying the right thing. So a righteous response after being offended, you're entitled to that. <coughs> Absolutely. But just make sure it's something you'll be happy to say in a week's time as well. So if you're happy to stand by it, by what you've said, yeah. own your words yeah. back. Yeah. All right, that's all I need. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I look, I, I know for myself, the, um, I've had um, people write to me, you know, about things, and I go, oh. Yeah, that's right, and the keyboard's smoking, you know, and I'm like, oh, that feels better, and then I go, if I send that, I'll lose my job, <laughs> you know, and so you've got to come back to it and go, okay, Lord, I'm going to come back to this tomorrow, and I've literally come back three or four days later, and I'm like, that can go on record for the rest of my life, that's, that could be defined as who I am in this, in this category of this problem now, but it takes a lot of work, you know, I believe but it's the work God's doing in you. That's why I say, you know, question yourself about what God's doing in you in that moment of being offended. Yeah. That's good. A good question, Sue. Yeah, really. Very real. Yeah. Anybody else got any thoughts? <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm just wondering, how would you translate this for children? Because some children, they learn to forgive, but they learn to make excuses. For that forgiveness, I forgave them because they were feeling sad. Or I forgave them because they were having a bad day. So it's giving them a way out and, you know, not actually holding them accountable for whatever they've done. So I can understand, you know, the need to forgive, but not giving that person a, a way out of being accountable, especially if it's a child versus parent. Mm. So how, how would you... Uh, break it down for a child. They well, don't make excuses for the adult's behaviour. Yeah. Um, I'll ask Bernie to answer that because he's got his first child on the way. I have no <laughs> idea, Monica. If, he's, if he was like me, he knew everything before the children arrived. That's not true. No, I, I I'm not. saying he's like me. Um, I don't know if you... I, I, Monica? Go, yeah. go, you go ahead first. I, yeah. I don't really have anything to say. <laughs> well, I guess it is tricky because... There's part of it, kind of like what Craig has talked about, there's the maturing of understanding what forgiveness is. And when we're very little, we, we don't really understand it. And we do see it as a way of just getting out of an awkward situation, which I think a lot of kids feel more say than... sorry, not yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which a lot of younger kids feel more than the understanding of, I need to forgive this person because I did X wrong. And they're like, yeah. this is uncomfortable. I don't like it. To make my mum happy, I'm going to say this and move on. Um, so potentially there's, there's like a maturing that needs to happen there that we all have to go through. But then again, there's some 30-year-olds who do still do the exact same thing. <laughs> That's right. um, so I think you could apply the same question to how do you teach a 30-year-old to, f to forgive not like a child. Um, but Monica, I think, has a great thing to say. <laughs> well, probably, like, I guess age-appropriate. I guess it depends on every situation's kind of different, I suppose, yeah, on, on the scenario um, and saying sorry, I think it's a good thing to teach little kids. Yes, yeah, say you're sorry, but I think as the adult, to be able to kind of bring context to the situation, you know, and you did, you can't keep doing that, you know, to explain to them. But older kids, to maybe to have them accountable if there's consequences to their mm -hmm. behavior. Forgiveness, saying you're sorry, doesn't mean that you don't get out of what's coming next, you know, mm -hmm. um, that there are consequences for your behavior. Yeah. 
I suppose, without turning into a parenting seminar, <laughs> it's just really consistency, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you want, you want your child to be consistently um, uh, disciplined in a way that they know what the consequences are for their actions. And, and that consistency is actually a real safety net for them because they, they'll know where those boundaries are. Yeah. Even modelling. Yeah, I know for the up. amount of times I had to go back to my girls and say, Mommy's so sorry. Yeah. That I had to really model that, that I had to ask their forgiveness as well. Yeah, when I lost my temper or whatever or something was, un or I, I was being unreasonable, I had to do that a lot. Mm. Yep, we usually do, all of us. Does, does that help with your question? S sort of. Sort um, of. I w I'm thinking more of the example whereas the adult mm. is not showing how to forgive. Oh, okay. So the adult has the, the issue and the child's learning that, oh, if I have an issue, I don't have to forgive or I can keep holding on to it for so long. So it's like, how do I teach him how to forgive and not hold on to it by not emulating what he's seeing? So how, how do I differentiate between how an adult is behaving and how he should behave? How do I teach that forgiveness? I suppose it's, without it's, being like too adult, you know. Yeah, it's just right sizing it, isn't it? You know, um, you know, your three-year-old probably hasn't emptied your liquor cabinet, so you know your your right, the problem that they've had is they've probably stolen their little friend's lollies, you know. So that's you know you talk about it at that level, and therefore the the you know the boundaries that you have to reinforce are right size for that too. So it is about situational stuff. And every child's different. This parent knows what their child is like. Yeah, I know our kids still talk about the fact, and they, they hate me for it, but I get my two girls to, after they were fighting, to sit down on the couch and hold hands for 10 minutes. <laughs> and they just, they just hated that. In fact, yeah. yeah. In fact, it's, um, it's hard when it's an adult you know, we'd modeling that. Hey. On that one. It's hard when it's an adult modeling unforgiveness or holding on to something. Yeah. And I think maybe as they get older or even explaining in those times before bed or when you're alone with them to maybe to bring context for their little minds that I know, let's just say daddy or grandpa acted that way, but just have you know that, that Jesus always forgives you or just put some context around that, that they may see something, however, mommy would forgive you or this is how I would react or put something how you would model that. I guess, yeah, kind of maybe trying to bring some perspective for them because that's a hard situation to be in when they're seeing something else, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's all right. Come and see Bernie afterwards. I, I, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can figure it out together. That's right, yeah. Right. Anybody else got anything they want to just ask or, or add? Sue. So, Darren's coming. He's prancing towards you. Oh, oh, oh. Is that a chair there, Darren? Curtain. Curtain. Hey, just know that we're family, so you guys can ask. So if there's something that's on your mind or your heart, go go for it. You've got we've got Craig here, the big this boss. This is a harder so. question, though. Yeah. Sue's been thinking about. It. She's yeah, this is a taking it up a notch. Mm -hmm. Is that working? There we go. A lot of us in this day and age, unfortunately, have gone through some pretty awful stuff in our past, and we've let it go. How do we know, when we look back on it, that we've really, truly forgiven? Yeah, you know what, that's a... Um, I had that same question to my pastor about four or five years in to my Christian walk. You know, the reason why is that... Um, you know, you sort of look back at your life and you think, man, there's some dumb stuff I did and, you know, other people got hurt as a result of it or whatever. And, um, and he looked me in the eye and he said, how much do you really believe that Jesus died for your sins? And I said, I really believe it. And he goes, well, your sins are nailed to that cross and it's, it's your head and your heart catching up with what Christ has already done for you. And, and so... Um, you know, your mind can be convinced, but your heart still sometimes punishes you. You know, and you've got to realize that your conscience is an agent of the law. It keeps on accusing you. You know, you're always, 
having an argument with your conscience about the past. And we're always, we always do that. You know, we look in the mirror and we'll see the pimple rather than, you know, what it is that we, we have this, this creation made in the, in the image of God, you know. You'll paint the wall and you'll see the little bit where you went over the trim, you know. You'll wash the car and you'll see the dirty mud flaps. Ah! You know, you'll cook a meal for somebody and you'll notice that, that, that one bit of pumpkin's burnt or something. It's, it's our conscience, always accusing us all the time. And um, we, we need to bring our, our thoughts captive into, in, 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 into obedience under Christ. And, and it's, it's an ongoing journey. It, it, not this forgiveness stuff and, and that self-accusation is just an ongoing part of the Christian life, but you slowly grind it down. It, it's stuff that just gets ground away until we actually see ourselves in Christ for whom we are. And then we just, you know, you get to the place where you're astounded by the goodness of God. And um, you don't hold yourself perpetually accused and perpetually feeling guilty for the life that you've had, you know, um, and that's the beauty of the work of the cross. But it take, takes time, yeah. yeah. But it's a good question, yeah. Sue. It's a really, really normal question. Um, and it's something that, as a Christian community, once we, once we get our head around it, that's when we're, we become new creations. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, you know, and that's a big part of it, grinding away to see ourselves as Christ sees us. Yeah. Um, Ava, did you yeah. did you want us to do you want us to do something punishment wise to Paul? Or? Okay, we can arrange that. <laughs> um, our life group did a really interesting study with Andy Stanley, and all of us in the life group still remember the little mantra that he had in that um, whole series, and it was, and you can really address it with, um, you know, um, wanting to do some damage maybe to somebody that's done you harm, but it's like this, in the light of my, you know, how does it go? Um, in the light of my f- past experience and my present um, circumstances and my future hopes and dreams and aspirations, is this the wise thing to do? Yeah. It might be the right thing to do, that you want to go and hop in the car and go down and just te- tell the teacher off that he's given yeah. you a kid, you know, whatever. But is it the wise thing to do? Because not only do you embarrass your child, you might break the relationship between you and the teacher. So mm. I know that one of the guys in our life group has even used it in his board meeting. You know, he he um, tailored it to that as well. And yeah. I think if we remember, sometimes, you know, our tongue can damage, do a lot of damage for a long time. But if we just have that little mantra, yeah. in the light of your past experience, your present circumstances, and your future Hopes and dreams, is this the wise thing to do? Is this the wisest thing to do? It's really good, isn't it? Because that causes you to stop. Yeah. Look at the big picture. Yeah. Not just whether your fries are bigger or smaller. Because that's what it comes back to sometimes. Yeah. Okay. I think we might be done. Um, I think we probably should uh, leave it with a song. Uh, leave the song for tonight, but... You know that song that um, Grace led us in tonight, that second one? You know, so, will I. so Will I. You remember the words of that? You know, if God forget, you know, created a billion stars and we, we will worship, you know, worship, they will worship him, so will I. You know, I, I sort of was thinking about all this forgiveness stuff and that in light of that big picture, you know, of the God who created the world, sent his only son to die for us. And when it's all wrapped up, you know, we get to celebrate those billion stars and those billion solar systems and, and all that. And I'm like, man, we just got to right size our lives, don't we? Because, um, you know, we can, we can turn our lives into some sort of Kardashian drama, you know? God help us all, you know? Really, seriously, God help the Kardashians, you know? Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And God help us all for even allowing them onto our televisions, yeah. you know? Local Tauranga pastor proclaims God needs to help the Kardashians. <laughs> Trending in all news outlets. Okay. I'm going to pray for us. Probably said enough tonight. Father, we thank you that at the very core of your being is Christ. And not only did he demonstrate how to live, but in his death he, 
showed us what grace looks like, showed us what forgiveness looks like. And we're the people who can take on that, that example, that living example, and we can come through it and be, we can be people of the resurrection. So whatever we have faced, whatever we have endured, we can see beyond it and we can see you enduring for our sake that we would be forgiven. And where we have hurt others, Lord, we, we just pray that we can go through a process of reconciliation. Not to just be forgiven and forget, but to ensure that things are put right where they can be. Lord, we, um, we know that difficult times for us do create maturity and that defines our character. It helps us to grow. So even in the midst of difficult things that we endure, we just invite you into that place and say, Lord, what am I going to learn from this? So God, we're all in this together. We're all going to struggle at times. We're all going to be misrepresented or we'll see things in the wrong way and, and even in our hearts accuse people of doing wrong or being wrong. And so that's just the, the human condition. But allow us, Lord, as a community to bear with one another, to put that overarching love upon our relationships which binds us in unity. Allow us to be the church, to admonish one another, speak truth in love, and to help us grow. Help us grow into the image of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.